Mark Hyman is the founder and senior advisor for the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. He's founder and director of the Ultra Wellness Center, host of the Doctors Pharmacy podcast with over 170 million downloads. He's author of 15 New York Times bestsellers, including the recently released number one national bestseller, Young Forever. We're going to dig into that today. Um, he's the co-founder and chief medical officer of Function Health. Dr. Hyman received the Christian Book of the Year Award for his work on the Daniel Plan, a faith-based wellness initiative that helped the Saddleback Church collectively lose 250,000 um, pounds that he created with Rick Warren. He is the founder and chairman of the nonprofit The Food Fix Campaign, dedicated to transforming our food and agriculture system through policy. And I know what you're all thinking, how could he, all, how could he have possibly done all this and only be in his 40s? Um, but actually, he's thriving in his 60s um, and here to show us how we can do the same and look good while doing it. <laughs> hey, everybody. Are you all sufficiently hot? Getting vitamin D? <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious here in the audience. I want to I want to start with you all. Raise your hand if you are interested in living to, say, 120 years old. Ah, okay. And Mark, are you interested in living to 120? At least. At least. <laughs> so why? Why would anyone want to live that long? Well, you know, I think people think that uh, it's a hedonistic pursuit to want to live to be a long time and very old. But for me, I think it's really taking advantage of the accumulated wisdom that happens as we get older to solve the world's problems. We get more experience, we hopefully get smarter, hopefully get wiser. Not everybody does, obviously, but there's an opportunity for us to really dig in and solve some of the world's big problems and be able to show up in a way that's very different than when we're figuring out our life. You know, I, I feel like, you know, I'm 63 and I'm finally figured shit out and like, it would be a shame if I croak next year, right? And now I can actually do the things that really matter and do it from a place where it's in service uh, to a greater good. Wow, that's powerful. No, I love this. This is usually people think about decline in the second half of their life and, you know, getting to catch up on soap operas and play more golf. But you're really talking <laughs> Shuffleboard. about... Shuffleboard. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's often because if you're tired, right? But are, you're not tired. You have actually more energy and abundance of overflowing energy to give back to the world. Right? That's right. I mean, I think, you know, we kind of expect that as we get older, that things go wrong, you know, that we become more frail and decrepit and weak and dysfunctional that we get sick. And it's true because when we look around, we see people who get older tend to get sicker and less able to do the things they want in their life. But the truth is that we now have the science to unpack how our bodies work and to activate these ancient embedded longevity pathways that are really our survival mechanisms that we've evolved over hundreds of thousands of years. And we can actually feel better, do better, and actually be more healthy as we get older, if we want. And that's what's happened to me. I, I really was very sick in my 30s and 40s. And, and as I got older, I started to learn about this science more in depth and use the power of functional medicine to actually activate my body's own endogenous healing systems. And I've done that with thousands of patients. And it's kind of remarkable what you see. And would you mind for those in the audience that aren't familiar with functional medicine, kind of starting with the basics, what are we yeah. talking about with functional medicine? Well, who, who's here heard of functional medicine? Okay. I'm not bad. Okay. <laughs> I may be. That's good. This is a smart yeah, audience. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to underestimate these guys again. Well, you know, it's amazing because I, I, you know, five years ago or, t you know, there was just, wouldn't have been very many people to raise their hand. And, and 10 years ago, probably nobody. And, you know, I've been at this for almost 30 years. And the, the, the truth is that we're in this extraordinary paradigm shift in science right now and in the science of biology. You know, for the last, you know, a few hundred years, we've unpacked the laws of physics, you know, the laws of gravity and thermodynamics, uh, quantum theory, relativity, and it's amazing. Now we understand how the world, the physical world works, but in terms of medicine, it's a very young science and we have not mapped out very well the laws of biology. How do things work? How does, how does your body work? I mean, most people know how to work their car and their iPhone more than they understand what's going on under the skin of their body. And for the first time, I think we're, we're in this in this quantum leap 
uh, 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 when we really I'm begin to unpack how the body's organized. And it's not organized as we learn in medical school, which is a bunch of different organs and body parts, and that we now diagnose disease by tracking symptoms and using medications to suppress symptoms. Functional medicine is really the science of health as opposed to the science of disease. And when you understand the science of health, you understand how to create the conditions where disease doesn't arise. And if you are sick and you use the same science to create health, disease goes away as a side effect. And, it, and, and we see things that seem to be miracles. And I'll just give you a couple of stories. Is that yeah, okay? Yeah, please. I, I, you know, I, I, I had a, a many patients who have, you know, what seem to be chronic conditions that are really not amenable to Western traditional care that have to be, quote, managed. Uh, one patient I had at Cleveland Clinic was a 50-year-old executive coach, business coach, who had depression. She had um, pre-diabetes. She was overweight. Um, she had severe reflux, irritable bowel, and she had something called psoriatic arthritis, which is a terrible skin condition, but also where your joints become destroyed. And she was on a medication for her arthritis. It cost 50 grand a year. Plus, she was on medication for her gut. She was on medication for her depression, medication for her pre-diabetes. And basically seeing every different specialist at the top, one of the top institutions in the world. And she was still suffering. I mean, she was maybe a little bit better, but rather than treat all her different diseases and all her different symptoms, I was like, what is the root cause? How do I create health? What are the things that are out of balance that are driving disease for her? And for her, you know, I, I, all of her conditions were inflammatory, heart disease, I mean, uh, diabetes or prediabetes, depression is inflammation of the brain. Reflux, you know, irritable bowel, these are all inflammatory diseases. Obviously, psoriatic arthritis was an inflammatory disease. So I said, rather than, you know, what do I need to give her to suppress the inflammation? I'm like, why is her immune system so pissed off in the first place? So ba basically, it was her gut. And the microbiome, we now understand, is the root cause of so much of what goes wrong with us, and including aging. It's one of the underlying hallmarks of aging, and we'll, we'll talk about what those are. And in, uh, instead of treating all her disease, I said, let's get your gut sorted. Let's put you on an anti-inflammatory diet, get you off of gluten, dairy, sugar, processed food, and let your gut heal. Let's give you some probiotics and some fish oil, vitamin D. Let's clear out the bad bugs. So I, I fixed her gut by giving her an anti actually an antibiotic to clear out the really bad bugs because she had bacterial overgrowth. And I gave her uh, antifungals because she'd been on lots of steroids and antibiotics. And with six weeks, she came back and... She, and I didn't tell her to do this, but she said, I stopped all my medications and I don't have any symptoms. My arthritis is gone, my stress is gone, my depression is gone, my reflux is gone, my irritable bowel is gone, I'm sleeping well, and um, I lost 20 pounds. So that's not a miracle, it's just the application of the science of functional medicine to activate the body's own innate healing systems. And that's, that's the same me method we use for addressing the problems of aging, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, dementia, the, call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse because they are driving most of the conditions that we see as we get older and cancer, obviously. And so what I'm so excited about is that the, the map of functional medicine that we've used for decades to start to, to, to really create health and to treat disease are being mirrored in the emerging science of longevity. Mm -hmm. So uh, has anybody heard of the hallmarks of aging? Yeah. My, my partner, Brianna, has for a long time now. <laughs> I talk about all that. But the hallmarks of aging are essentially these phenomena that have been observed by longevity scientists that seem to explain almost all the diseases that we see. So the number one and two killers in the world, for example, are heart disease and cancer. If we cured heart disease and cancer and erased them from the face of the planet, how long more do you think we'd live? Anybody? 40 years? No. Five to seven years. That would be it, which is something, but it's not that much. If we address the hallmarks of aging, we would see a 30 or 40 year life extension. That means you would live to be 120 years old and you don't have to treat all the diseases. So what's amazing about the hallmarks of aging is they map almost perfectly to the functional medicine paradigm, which is looking at how do we restore optimal function in the core system of the body? For example, your microbiome, your immune system, your energy system, your mitochondria, your detoxification system, your communication systems, your hormones, neurotransmitters, your, your circulatory and lymph system, your structural system, how these systems are 
actually um, in balance or out of balance determines your health and determines the rate at which you're aging and determines uh, really the vibrancy and energy you have to do whatever you want to do in the world, right? So at the end of the day, it's not about longevity per se. It's about having the energy and vitality to show up and and live life fully, right? To be able to love, to be able to show up and do the work you want to do in the world, to solve the world's problems, to be there for your friends, to actually make the world a better place. And if you feel like crap, which a lot of us do, we're not able to actually do that. We want to sit home and watch TV and eat Twinkies, you know? But but I think most of us, most of us don't want that. And most of us want to be able to find that key. What is the key or the switch or the the dials we can turn on our biology to actually activate our own vitality and health. And as a consequence, you will increase your health span, which is how long you're healthy, and you will most likely increase your lifespan. Wow. So basically, were those the hallmarks of aging? Because I was no, listening for those. No, I, okay. I, I, those are the so, functional medicine things. The but functional the, the hallmarks medicine. of aging, I'll just kind of run through them. Yeah. It used to be nine. I put 10 in my book. There's now 13, but essentially, <laughs> the, 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 but the problem with the longevity uh, scientist model is that they're they're actually trying to treat each one of these as as if they're a problem by intervening with a drug or some pathway rather than getting that you have to treat the system. So functional medicine is really about ecosystem medicine. So the hallmarks that are, are, are not all equal and the master hallmark that regulates a lot of these other ones is called deregulated nutrient sensing. And I'm going to just kind of, you probably never heard of that, but what you have heard about is fasting. You ha have heard about mTOR. You probably have heard about metformin and longevity. You probably heard about resveratrol and wine and, and making rats live longer. You probably have heard about these things, but you don't know exactly how they all fit together. So there's these four master longevity switches. I call them longevity switches which are ancient preserved systems across almost all species, even yeast, for example. And if we learn how to properly regulate these pathways, mTOR, insulin signaling, sirtuins, and AMPK, and I'll explain what those are, we can actually, do people want to know the science here? Are you into that or? You want, yes. Okay. I can go deep, but if you want to go deep. <laughs> okay. You want to go deep? Who doesn't want to go deep? Okay. You can, we can dance it off after, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it <laughs> so take us deep okay. on the science Mark. so the, there's these, <laughs> these four pathways that, that are are responding to our nutritional intake the quality of our food they respond to also other stresses like uh exercise hot and cold various phytochemicals we call this hormesis so there's a lot of doorways that turn these longevity switches and, and they, they influence all the other ones. So the other ones, and I'm going to then come back to the nutrient sensing ones. The other ones include things you might have heard about, like mitochondrial dysfunction, which is you know how we make energy, or inflammation, or stem cell exhaustion, how our stem cells poop out as we age, or damage to our DNA that accumulates over our lifetime from the 1,000, 100,000 cuts we get all the time or damage to proteins that happens as we age. And you might have heard about, for example, A1C or hemoglobin A1C if you have diabetes. That's just a damaged protein where sugar and, and proteins kind of connect and they form this you know, uh, abnormal protein and that accumulates in our body. We get zombie cells. Zombie cells are these aging cells that uh, we call senescent cells that spew out inflammation everywhere and they, they just create havoc but they never die. Um, and you get shortened telomeres, and you might see altered cell communication and hormonal regulation. Uh, I don't know if I forgot any, but I probably did. But anyway, they, these are the basic things that tend to go wrong. And and what's amazing is that you don't have to individually treat all of the different ones, you know. But if you understand how to use diet and lifestyle, and maybe some other cool interventions, including phytochemicals, uh, nutrients, even medication, we can actually properly regulate these systems and create a downstream effect that makes us younger. And one of the important ones that I didn't mention is what we call epigenetic uh, changes. Does anybody know what epigenetics is? So for those of you who don't, you have your genome, which is basically fixed, you know, absent gene editing. You have 20,000 genes, let's say. And and by the way, 3,000 of those genes are, 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 um, <coughs> are genes that are uh, designed for survival that help us adapt to 
survive stressful, difficult situations. And these are the genes that are the longevity genes. And so your genes are fixed, but you have something that regulates your genes. It's called your epigenome. It sits above. Epi means above. It sits above your genes and it regulates your genes. And it determines whether you are aging fast or slow, turning on disease genes or health genes. And the, think of it like the piano keys or 88 keys on a piano. They're fixed. But the epigenome is like, the piano player and the piano player can play rag or ragtime or jazz or rock or blues or classical because there's this, this infinite kind of amount of, of change that can happen and so what happens as you age is you get epigenetic damage that actually makes you age faster so you might have had some of you who's here had a biological age test like uh okay great you guys are out there so this is this is a test that measures the um, biological age through what we call dna methylation so your dna gets tagged by these little marks, like bookmarks on your DNA. And so read this gene, don't read this gene, quiet this one, activate this one, and that's your epigenome. And so you can actually regulate your epigenome to age faster or to age backwards. So I'm 63 and a half, but my epigenetic age is 43. Right, and that's possible for, for all of us to do that. Yeah, I told you he's in his 40s. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely immature for my age, but. Uh, uh, the, the reality is that we have this in, built-in capacity, this in, built-in regeneration, healing, and repair, renewal system. And, and if we learn how to activate it, we can reverse our biological age through epigenetics. And so all of these things that I talked about, um, these four longevity switches, the mTOR, insulin signaling, AMPK, and sirtuins, all are these master regulators. So they're kind of cool, and, and, and we can talk about how they all work um, and I don't know if I, I want you to just dive in or you have another. Well, yeah, I'm wondering, let's see, because we want to, you know, we want to approach the science, but we also want to make sure to talk about each of these different components yeah. of the plan, because yeah. part of what you do such a good job at in your books is taking all this complexity and help giving people good guidelines of what to do. Like, what do we eat? How do we exercise? How do we metabolize stress? How do we think about sleep? So maybe we can kind of. Yeah walk through the different components of the Young Forever plan with this science lens in mind. Absolutely. So that's a great, great way to frame it. So the, all the hallmarks, all the, those, those pathways, those four longevity switches, they're all influenced by what we eat, how we exercise, by sleep, by stress, by our traumas. Um, and by the way, your emotional and psychological traumas are, are read into your epigenome. And, and it's generational. So if you're grandmother was in Auschwitz, that's going to be in your DNA. That bookmark on this is going to be on there. And we, we now have the science around how to look at that. Just first um, of all, I think that's really powerful that you bring that together in thinking about longevity and thriving because people often think of these as very separate, right? Yeah. That, you know, we might live in a very emotionally toxic family or grown up in one or have this in our culture and then do everything right on the exercise and sleep yeah, and health no. part. And it's still something's fundamentally eating at us from the inside, right? That's right. I mean, that is, is, is so true. Unless you heal that that um, deep, uh, and we, we all have it, like whether it's macro trauma or micro trauma, as Gabor Mate talks about, whether it's you incest or rape or psychological or societal. abuse or yeah, just the micro trauma of yeah. like just living today in the face of climate change and the economic crisis and the AI dilemma, <laughs> which some of you might be pretty depressed about if you went to Tristan Harris's uh, chat today but th these are all affecting us and they get they literally get read into our biology uh, so our mind and, and our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions and our traumas are all literally written in our dna and they're written in our physiology in a real way and so it, and actually in my book i do talk about the role of needing to address that your mindset your beliefs uh, even the use of psychedelics as a way to optimize for longevity if I even to deal with these traumas. So it, it's all part of the story. Um, and so in, in terms of what you eat, and I, I think these four, they call these nutrient sensing pathways, I'll, I'll start with what to eat, because I think that's very practical. And now that I kind of painted the picture, I want to sort of go into the practical stuff. And I love the title of your book, What the Heck Should I Eat, right? Because yeah. that's what, what people are thinking in the morning. <laughs> well, I wanted to call it, What the Fuck Should I is. Eat? But my publisher wouldn't let me. That was before the subtle of not giving a fuck was a best-selling book. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so when you think about these pathways, two of them detect uh, too much of stuff, like an excess of nutrients, 
sugar, carbohydrates, and then that's insulin signaling. And mTOR uh, detects uh, too much protein or even carbohydrates, also sugar. And then two of the pathways detect scarcity, which is AMPK and sirtuins. So if you want to eat in a way that properly regulates these, and it's not that they're bad or good pathways, it's just we overdo some and underdo others, right? We overdo eating and underdo fasting, for example. And so uh, insulin signaling, you've got to really shut that down for the most part, except, you know, um, you know, having, having just the right amount. Because if you, if you overstimulate insulin, this is the single biggest driver of almost all age-related diseases. It's something called insulin resistance, which is also, you know, described as prediabetes. And 93.2% of Americans have either uh, a, a high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high blood sugar, are overweight, or have had a heart attack or stroke. That means they are somewhere in the continuum of prediabetes and insulin resistance. Wow. 93.2% of us. Not most of you on the boat probably, but most of the rest of the people out there. And it's, it's the thing that causes cancer and heart disease and diabetes and dementia, which is called type 3 diabetes. I just did a podcast recorded this week with a guy who's uh, been studying what we call metabolic oncology for the last 30 years and has mapped out how, you know, cancer cells, for example, require sugar to function. They can't run on fat. So you starve them with a ketogenic diet. And now there's a tremendous amount of research using ketogenic diets. And so you, you, you want to really reduce sugar and starch. And that's if, if you take nothing else away from your, your this conversation, getting that to a minimum or very low level is really important. This flour and sugar. It's not that you say you never have it, but it's a recreational drug, right? It's like you might like to take acid, but you don't take it every day. <laughs> right? Or you might like tequila. And you don't, well, maybe Stephen Brooks does. I don't know. And by the way, Stephen, I, I, in preparation for my talk today, I was in the room by myself and I put on the fish tunes. <laughs> they were great. I was surprised. <laughs> I'm kind of a dead fan, so I'm a little bit of snob. So I think I'm coming around. <laughs> so... Um, Okay, so it's, how can we eat in a so, way where we're so thinking eat, about eating less starch and sugar? Okay, and then the second thing is mTOR. mTOR is activated by either eating sugar and carbs and food all the time, or too much protein over time. And so you might have heard about maybe this drug called rapamycin. Who's heard about rapamycin? A lot of longevity enthusiasts are taking it. This drug was is discovered um, on Rapa Nui, Easter Island. It's named after that. And mTOR is named after that drug, which is called mammalian target of rapamycin. So this drug binds to this pathway, this, this transcription factors, and inhibits it. It silences it or kind of calms it down. When you inhibit mTOR, it activates the incredible cascade of repair and longevity. So it repairs your DNA. It induces autophagy, which is a self-cleaning and Cannibal, self cannibalism to clean up old damaged stuff. It uh, inhibits inflammation. It, it, it suppresses cancer growth. It, there's so many beneficial things that we need to live a long, healthy life. And so we need to inhibit mTOR on a regular basis. And the best way to do that is an overnight fast. So 12 hours minimum, but ideally 14 to 16, and even longer fast for 24, 36 hours or even a longer fast, th three days, you can do longer fast. And that, that activates this incredible repair mechanism. And, and people who survive Auschwitz or concentration camps, they have incredible longevity. It's not because they are living healthy lifestyles, it's because in the period of their life, they had these, these pathways really activated. And so mTOR inhibition is really important. But then, you know, it's not just about fasting all the time or being a vegan, because if you don't activate mTOR, then you won't build muscle. And muscle is essential for longevity, it's the currency of longevity. If you lose muscle, you become frail and weak, fall and have all these diseases. But muscle isn't just like to make you look good or move your bones around. It's actually an incredibly important metabolic organ. It's the biggest sponge for glucose in your body. It regulates your hormones. And as we lose muscle, so we can be the same weight at 65 that we were at 25 and be twice as fat. And, and instead your, your muscle goes from a filet mignon to a ribeye. And that's bad because because that uh, fatty muscle doesn't function well and it causes higher stress hormones, lower growth hormone, lower testosterone, more insulin resistance, more inflammation. And so you end up accelerating all the things with aging. So you, you have to inhibit mTOR, but you can't keep it off all the time. 
And so you need to turn on. And when the, when you th- do fasting, refeeding is really important. So this is a really power powerful tip here. In addition to reducing sugar, when you do your overnight fast or the first meal of the day, shouldn't be dessert, which it is for most of the world. <laughs> I mean, most of America anyway, which is cereal, you know, pancakes, French toast, bagels, muffins, croissants. That's all sugar for breakfast. That's a disaster. You need a load of protein in the morning, 30, 40 grams at least, to activate muscle synthesis. So that's like a real power tip. So overnight fast, cut down sugar and starch, protein in the morning. That's super important. And, and, and so that will help you kind of activate these pathways. The other things are the, the other two pathways, and, and MPK and sirtuins, they detect low nutrient states. So when you're fasting, they also get activated, and they, they have this whole cascade of benefits, right? Everything you want to do to live a long time. They inhibit cancer. They activate your mitochondria to function better and grow more. They reduce inflammation. They re- increase your antioxidant status. They do all these amazing things. And, and so uh, what's beautiful about uh, these pathways is they're not just influenced by what we're eating or not eating. They're also influenced by um, lifestyle factors and by phytochemicals. So has anybody heard of this idea of, of hormesis? Does anybody know what hormesis is? Anybody been in the sauna or the cold plunge? That's hormesis, okay? It's basically a stress that doesn't kill you that makes you stronger. Exercise, people are in the gym, that's hormesis. So hormesis is this, is this concept that, you know, is really important to longevity because for, for us in the modern world, we're completely sheltered from any kind of stress. We get abundant food whenever we want it, all the time, 24 seven. We don't have to get uh, even out of our house to get it now, you have DoorDash and Uber Eats. And we basically uh, have an overabundance of food. We don't have to move our bodies. We, we don't have to deal with any extremes of temperature uh, and regulating our biology. So we, we're kind of soft. And, and what happens is these ancient survival pathways are activated by stress. When you're starving or when you're in extremes, your body then kicks in this incredible regenerative repair system to keep you alive longer, right? And so things like the phytochemicals are hormetic compounds. So plant compounds are the other part of eating well, which is these incredible medicines in food. And now what really blows my mind is that you know, how do they know what to do? Like, how, how do these, these molecules in food actually know what receptors to bind to in the body and how to activate this pathway or that pathway to keep us healthy and alive and live longer? It just blows my mind. So, you know, things like, for example, you might have heard about green tea. Well, that activates, you know, um, uh, inhibits mTOR or activates AMPK or resveratrol from red wine activates uh, sirtuins and sirtuin activation causes DNA repair and also NAD does that same thing. But you know, resveratrol, you have to be careful with the wine because in the studies they use 1500 bottles of red wine and you did that and you're not going to live very long. So don't do that. But the, the, the molecules are incredibly important and so you have to include them and the top ones that activate these pathways are green tea, curcumin, um, and things like uh, resveratrol, uh, glucofarnin, which is from uh, broccoli, and uh, I'm blanking, a quercetin. Quercetin is really important, and that comes from you know apples and uh, onions. It's, it's a really important compound for longevity. And, and there's a whole host more that I talk about in the book, but uh, pomegranate, for example, has something that gets metabolized into your lithin A by your microbiome. I mean, this is like even more mind-blowing, how we're so synergistically connected to the ecosystem. Like we think we're just like these humans that are independent beings that are not connected to nature. Well, we, we are so uh, co-evolved with nature that, that we have to understand if we don't follow the laws of nature, the laws of biology, we're not going to thrive. And so when you you know, eat pomegranate, if you have a healthy microbiome, uh, compounds, phytochemicals in the pomegranate get metabolized to this thing called urolithin A. And urolithin A, turns out, is this incredible molecule. It's called a postbiotic because it's made from your gut bacteria, you absorb it, and then it goes and activates these pathways like the uh, inhibiting mTOR, or it activates AMPK, or it actually increases mitochondrial function, increases fitness level without exercising, increases muscle mass. It's really quite amazing. And so we have to be living in this synergistic, symbiotic relationship with our environment. And so, like you said, it's not just, that's the food part. So Cut down, start, start and sugar. We covered eat. food and also a little bit of fasting and a little bit of hormesis. Yeah, I think you got I, some of that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cut down sugar and starch, eat overnight fast, eat protein in the morning and lots of phytochemicals. And that would get you like 90% of the way there. And then there's all this other cool stuff we can do. 
like exercise. Now, exercise is, uh, is, is probably the most important thing in terms of longevity other than food. And food is really important, but exercise becomes more important as you get older because the body starts, you know, based on the law of uh, thermodynamics, the second law is entropy, right? Everything falls apart. So if you don't put energy in the system, you're going to degrade. And, and resistance training or strength training or weights or bands or body weight or whatever you want to do is essential if you want to function and live a long time to preserve muscle, to build muscle and to, you know, obviously prevent you from falling. And, and more importantly, to let you what you want to do in your life. You know, like I'm 63 and, and Brianna and I are going to go trekking for two weeks at, you know, 14,000 feet in the Himalayas because I want to and I want to be able to do that when I'm 100, you know. And so uh, I think there's no reason we can't do that if we take care of this meat suit that we have and we understand how to activate these ancient pathways. Well, yeah, you know, I love this, like taking care of the meat suit. Um, <laughs> well, I'm wondering how, how when people have these like pain or challenge or conflicts yeah. in their body, um, the rec to speak a little bit about your program, about the recovery, the sleep, the yeah, yeah, yeah. stress reduction. Like, how do we heal and recover? Well, not on the boat, but when we get home. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the community and connection, um, yeah. recreational yeah, part, I mean, the joy of life. Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, what, what Christian is talking about is, is, is other like um, less obvious things that really matter. Um, one of the most important is is the power of community and connection and love and meaning and purpose. And that's what we're doing here at Summit, and that's why we're here, and and it, it's it's really medicine for us. And it's not in an abstract way. We know how it influences our genes. We know how it influences our hormones and our brain chemistry and our microbiome and and pretty much everything that matters. So, so cultivating and building relationships, connection, meaning, and purpose is such a key part of longevity. It's what they have in spades in the blue zones where they live to be very old. But also we have to sort of regulate our rhythms. People don't understand that, that circadian rhythms really matter for longevity. That means having your, your, your chronobiology in balance, I mean, sleeping and waking at, at regular times when you go home and, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, having a, periods of real rest and deep restoration so um most of us you know think that you know resting might be just hanging out watching tv but there's a, a parasympathetic activation that it requires a, a work like you have to actively relax whether it's breathing or meditation or yoga and there's a thousand ways to, to activate that system being in nature is really an essential part of our biology and we can't just kind of push through it and drive ourselves in, in, into the ground. And, and I think those things around rest, recovery, sleep, sleep is so important. Sleep is when your body heals. It's when growth hormone goes up and cortisol goes down and you activate autophagy and self cleaning and you, your brain lymphatic system cleans out all the garbage in your brain. And so if you don't have adequate sleep, if you don't actually practice regular deep restoration i mean i i went to my room before this i just put on like a yoga nidra for like 15 minutes and just kind of like zombied out and so those are really important parts of our physiology that we have to do we have to literally actively relax um and and so those elements are so key to our biology that we can't ignore them and when you add all these things together this is when you see the reversal of biological age this is when you see these sort of amazing changes in people's biology so basically like there's a whole program and protocol that we can practice individually with our exercise, health, like eating, sleep, fasting, all of these things. But it's way better if we do it in community instead oh of God, yeah. putting together a protocol that makes us isolated from everyone we love. So totally, you know, I mean, make make healthy friends, and they make you healthy. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I I think it brings up a really important point is is that you know loneliness is just an epidemic, and you know it's equivalent to smoking two packs of cigarettes a day or being overweight. And it, it, it's an epidemic in this country. I, I got an email from a Washington Post reporter who said, I want to do an article. I read your book and I want to do an article about loneliness uh, and how important community is. And he said, because I realize I'm 70 years old and I don't have a single friend I can call. And I, and I was like, oh boy, you know, that was really heartbreaking. And it, I think that's true for so many Americans who, who really have a, an epidemic of loneliness and, and disconnection. And so uh, it actually first began to understand the power of this for health 
um, because you know Chris Christakis from Harvard wrote a book called Connected and did a lot of research based on the Framingham data that looked at obesity. And he found that you were much more likely to be overweight if your friends were overweight than if your family was overweight. Like you were 170% more likely to be overweight if your uh, friends were overweight than if your family was overweight. It was about 40%. But it occurred to me that, you know, bad, bad, bad outcomes are contagious, not infectious, but contagious, like obesity, but so can health be. Health can be also contagious. And, and so I, I made the, there's a term called non-communicable disease, which basically means like heart disease and cancer and diabetes, but it's wrong. It, it's 100% communicable. And it's really based on the social networks that we have that really determine our health. And I, as part of, what, you know, kind of understanding this, I went to Haiti and met Paul Farmer, who recently died, who was able to cure TB and AIDS, not by better drugs or surgery, but because he understood the power of community and he created something called accompaniment, where people accompany each other to health, community health workers, essentially, neighbors helping neighbors. And so I got back to America and I met this guy, Rick Warren, who's a, a pastor from Saddleback Church, came to see me as a patient. And uh, after I went to dinner with him and I said, hey, you know, I, um, I really don't know much about uh, your, you know, Christian churches. I'm a Jewish doctor from New York. He's like, well, you know, we have 30,000 people. And I'm like, wow, that's a mega church. He goes, yeah, we have 5,000 small groups that meet every week to help each other live better lives. I'm like, wow, that's not a mega church. That's thousands of mini ch churches. And so I said, Rick, why don't we put a healthy living program in your church? He's like, great, because I'm fat and my congregation's fat. And I was uh, baptizing them. And I'm like, we need, to, <laughs> we need to do this. And so we created this thing called the Daniel Plan. And we thought a few hundred people would show up. Uh, 15,000 people showed up. And they worked together in small groups. And over a year, they lost a quarter million pounds. We wrote a book about it called, yeah. I mean, That's it was so amazing. This wasn't, like, this wasn't like a health coach or a nutritionist. Or Can anybody. we keep doing this? Like Yeah, it's still going on. We, <laughs> we, we, it was like, I, uh, we sold mil over a million books. We wrote a book called The Daniel Plan. I, I won the Christian Book of the Year Award. The only Jew, I think, to ever get that award. <laughs> that was that other guy, but that was 2,000 years ago. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, it every year. <laughs> so the point is that that you know community is medicine food is medicine but community is medicine and that's why we're all here yeah that's so powerful and um no and i love that you just have you've identified these principles that are pretty universal in eating patterns lifestyle patterns community and now i want to talk about like the super personalized medicine that you talk about in your book and also maybe you can talk about the importance of that and how that bridges to uh function health yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, th there is no one size fits all prescription for everybody, you know, and, and the future of healthcare and functional medicine is about personalized medicine. It's understanding that no two people with the same disease have the same problem. Like you can have 10 people with rheumatoid arthritis or 10 people with migraines. And in traditional medicine, they're all treated exactly the same. In functional medicine, they're treated in a very personalized way that's based on the root causes. So, for example, somebody's migraine may be caused by their microbiome be out of balance or by gluten or because they have a mitochondrial issue or a hormonal dysfunction or uh, 10 other things, right? And so how do you begin to personalize the approach to each person's unique uh, set of situations in terms of their genetics or lifestyle and so forth? And so that's really, you know, where, where functional medicine really is, is powerful for longevity and for just health in general. And I, in the book, Young Forever, I go through and help you map out based on questionnaires where you're out of balance and what's going on in, in your body, and what tests and diagnostics to use to help uncover that. And so this is really what I've been doing for so many years, but the problem is, you know, there's not that many functional medicine doctors. There's so many sick people. And so uh, um, Jonathan Zordlin and I was in the front row there, uh, co-founded a company called Function Health to try to, to try to democratize functional medicine to get it accessible to millions of people and to scale it up by giving people the ability to do $15,000 worth of lab testing, over 106 biomarkers. It looks at every aspect of their health, from their hormones, to toxins, their metabolic health, nutritional health, and so on, and to actually get a roadmap for what's going on with them personally. And then based on that data, it's not just interpreted according to the conventional framework. It's interpreted based on a, uh, including a conventional framework, also a functional medicine framework. And then we use machine learning and AI to help look at the patterns in the data and then personalize recommendations. So there's a recommendation engine of, of what lifestyle changes you need to make, what dietary changes, what life, other lifestyle factors may be important to you, what supplements you may want to take. And then even, you know, what medications or what to do when you go to need to see the doctor. Like how, how do you actually be your own 
uh, best advocate for what to ask your doctor for because he or she may not know uh, what to do based on, for example, let's say you have a high mercury. They might say, oh, do you less fish? But that's not the whole answer. So it's a really powerful model for, for us to, to scale this. And, and um, uh, Jonathan and Generous, we are, are offering a, uh, a code because there's like 50,000 people on the wait list right now. Uh, so you all can get in for only a week uh, by go using uh, Summit 2023. The code is functionhealth.com, Summit 2023, but it expires in a week. So just if, if you think about giving to all your friends and family, it's kind of like a, a stopgap on that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is really powerful. This is amazing because I think that has been one of the biggest barriers to people being able to access functional medicine is just, you know, trying to get on the wait list for your practice and for those who have successful functional medicine practices. It just hasn't been. A, and then even when you do get into a doctor, these tests are so expensive and you often need to do them a few times like to keep checking and seeing how your levels are right. how much how, how much of my metals have gone down how's my yeast doing yeah. and like yeah that's and it's, hard it's, that's expensive it is and, the, and this is a membership model and there's repeat testing that's included and so you get to check at periodic levels and you can also test other things that aren't in the in, initial panels and it allows you to you know learn what's going on over time and it's it's a really dynamic interactive dashboard as a doctor you know, even working with your doctor is using it is so powerful because I, you know, I like I, I you know had a bunch of patients last week and like I get their past records and they have like twenty different PDFs with you know their blood tests from this date and that date and this date and I'm like, okay, what was that? Listen, I'm writing down on a piece of paper and like my notes on my computer. It's it's like so freaking analog. It's antiquated and and it's ridiculous. I mean, medicine is so analog and it, ne it needs to change and this is really why we're, we're building this so we can you know i know we had a kind of lot to hear about ai but i think there are positive applications for ai and i think you know the complexity i mean it's so immense for human biology i mean physics is you know complicated sending a rocket ship in space is super complicated but it's a knowable thing i mean humans can figure that out and know it all human biology is not like that i mean how many chemical reactions do you think there are in the body every second Anybody guess? 37 billion billion. He was pretty close. Mm -hmm. Usually you get a billion, 10 million, a billion, 37 billion billion. Now there's no human mind in the planet that can actually comprehend that. And so as we begin to use the the, the benefits of AI for good, not just for the, the bad that also seems to come with it, we can start to really activate learnings and and we're going to learn things that we didn't even know about the human body using this and using the lab data and your own data be able to get past data and put it all in a system where this becomes your sort of the center of your your healthcare. wow this is really powerful yeah um i want to talk about this other barrier um to people eating healthy and living a long life yeah. and that's our broken food system yeah um so you know you're doing these functional medicine tests um you're you're getting people are full of toxins right and and look and i i would love to see a show of hands for those of you who are intending to eat healthy intending to avoid sugar and starch intending to avoid these chemicals in your food how how many of you find it difficult to find healthy organic natural regenerative food yeah like even when you know, and even when you have the education, even when you have the resources. So then think out, outside at all the billions of people that are, are just eating what's in front so of them. Tough. Yeah, I mean, we have just so much processed food out there. It's like, a you know, we used to just like forage out in nature to try to find nutrients amongst all the toxic poisonous food. And now we just have to like field our way through all the processed food and junk to try to find something fresh. And then even a lot of these foods are hybridized, right? So the fruits and vegetables have been domesticated to be high sugar or to have a high shelf life. So they don't even have the nutrient value and the, and the freshness. So Mark, how do we fix our broken food system? <laughs> Well, yeah. So, you know, I realized as I was a practicing doctor that I, I, you know, I could see patient after patient and they were going to still come through the door and that I couldn't cure diabetes in my office. Uh, it was cured on the farm. It was cured in the food uh, systems uh, supply chain. It was cured in the kitchen, in the restaurants, in the grocery store. That's where these conditions are cured. And if we have a broken food system, we are going to perpetuate a very sick society. And you know, as I'm talking about this exciting science of longevity and how the body works and how we activate these healing pathways, the reality is that 
Like it's just not happening out there because we, we live in a completely toxic nutritional landscape. And, and, um, as I begin to really think about this as a functional medicine doctor, I'm always looking for what's the root cause. What's the cause of the cause of the cause? So if the cause of diabetes is the food, what's the cause of the food? Well, it's the food system and the food industry. Well, what, and what um, and our policy is doing to, to affect that. And so I begin to think, you know, well, this is really a bigger problem that has to be solved at a political level. And so, uh, you know, and Christiana and Kimball have been very helpful with our, uh, a nonprofit that I started called the, the Food Fix Campaign that's focused on trying to educate and, and advocate for important policy changes in Washington to transform our food system based on two key principles. One is food is medicine, and two is regenerative agriculture. And they kind of go hand in hand. And, um, you know, we actually had amazing success. We basically, for the first time in 53 years, had a White House conference on, on food and, and, and chronic disease and nutrition. Uh, and that, that created a whole national strategy to address this. We got a GAO report done, the Government Accountability Office, that looked at uh, basically what was going on with our food system in terms of the impact of our policies on chronic disease and the costs. And they found there were over 200 uh, different policies from 21 agencies and departments, none of which were coordinated and often working across purposes. So the dietary guidelines from the USDA might say, reduce your sugar intake, while on the other hand, the largest government benefit program, which is SNAP, $100 billion a year, $10 billion of that is for soda, and 75% of it's for processed, ultra-processed food full of sugar. So these, these kinds of things are going on, and we basically got the government to then create an entity, uh, passed a bill that allowed us to create an entity within uh, the government to uh, uh, actually create a framework for dealing with chronic disease nutrition. And that, I don't, I don't think I told you this, but we, we, um, I went to Washington uh, not too long ago and we basically met Yay, with- Hey, yeah, it's pause for applause there. This is not uh, a small thing. Yeah, it was, it was kind of cool. So we got to celebrate these wins. I mean, you think, you think it'd be like somebody in government thinking about this problem. Like the cost of, of Medicare is going to bankrupt this country. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, one in, one in, uh. Uh, five dollars of our GDP is for healthcare. Ninety percent of that's for food-related chronic disease, and like nobody's looking at it as a problem. And so we we actually I met with the the people who were appointed to head this thing. Well, thank you, thank you for doing this because you know we we really weren't able to do anything before that, and we only got a few million in the initial appropriations bill, and um, and we 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 uh, have to go around with a tin cup to the rest of the departments in HHS to get more money. But uh, we now sort of requested more from from the president's budget, and we asked for three million, and they came back and said, "How about twenty six million?" So that's going to help us to really build a framework for addressing this. We also were able to help with the IRA bill, which incorporated about twenty billion dollars to address uh, changes in our food system through farming, so regenerative agriculture, which is a huge win. So there's a lot of progress we're making working on a medically tailored meals bill uh, and a lot of things. So I back them going in a couple of weeks to Washington to have some hearings, which you, I'm sure, are going to all be watching on C-SPAN <laughs> <laughs> on June 7th, 9 o'clock in the morning, if you're interested. I'll be uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I you know, made really deep relationships. I'm working with the current uh, chairman of the Health Subcommittee of uh, Ways and Means, uh, which is appropriates all the money for Medicare. It's a trillion. He's like, I'm in charge of over a trillion dollars. And he like we're on the phone every week, uh, strategizing, talking, and and I'm really hopeful that we're going to see some some change. It's it's slow, and then it all happens all at once, right? Civil rights, you know, was going on for a long time, and and then you know there was a civil rights bill, and then there's you know things move forward. But it's it's a it's a it's really a, a problem we all have to work towards and all have to solve. And it's happening from the private sector, it's happening in the public sector, it's happening from philanthropy. So across the board, it's 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 got to be a big effort. Well, yeah, let's thank you. And let's 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 slow it down just a little bit. So there's two pieces to fixing our food system that you're focused on in the US. One is fixing the farming and the other is food as medicine. So what do we need to fix in our farming? Yeah, I mean, this is such a huge issue because you know, as a doctor, what the hell am I talking about farming for? <laughs> but, uh, you know, our food has become so transformed after World War II we we used uh, basically bomb making factories making you know nitrogen and uh, and chemical warfare um, factories making nerve gases 
uh, turn that into fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides. And we decided we need to feed a hungry world, which was important after World War II. And we basically created a very industrialized system where we grew a lot of starchy calories to feed a hungry world. And then we bred plants to have more starch, less nutrients, less protein. And so this is what we're seeing in, in, in our food supply is this overabundance of calories that are from basically sugar and starch with very little nutrients in them. And, and that's because the way we farm has actually killed the soil. And uh, it, it's not just impacting um, the food quality, but it's also a huge driver of climate change. As many of you know, one third of all the carbon of the trillion tons of carbon in the atmosphere today one third, 300 billion tons, came from the destruction of the microbiome of the soil, from the organic matter in the soil. And, and, and we did that through tillage, through poisoning the soil, killing the microbiome of the soil with glyphosate and pesticides. Not so different how we've been killing our microbiome it's exactly inside our right. bodies, right? It's exactly right. So like functional medicine is like regenerative agriculture for your body. And that's what we need for the farms. And, and, it, and when you actually restore the soil, I mean, um, Brown and I went to this incredible... Um, thing in, in Austin on, uh, on uh, the uh, Rome Ranch, which is part of the Force of Nature collaborative of, of regenerative uh, food and, and farming. And we went to a bison harvest, which was really intense. But we visited this farm and they, they don't do any tilling. They plant, you know, uh, seeds, tons of regenerative seeds that help restore the microbiome of the soil, that put nitrogen fixing plants on. And, and while while their neighbors' farms were all like in drought and they had to sell their cattle and it was a disaster, their farms were thriving and the soil microbiome was incredible. They increased the organic matter by sixfold. When you have one percent organic matter increase, you can hold twenty five thousand gallons of water. Creeks were coming back that were navigational creeks back for the uh, the the settlers. Uh, back back in the in the 1800s those are all dried up and now they're coming back because there's water seeping through and there's there's the restoration of ecosystems bald eagles are coming in wild animals are coming in and they're they're uh, even seeing um plants and seeds germinate that have been dormant for a hundred of years because the bison were all slaughtered and they only respond to bison dung which is amazing so this whole ecosystem gets restored and then the plants that are grown on them and the animals that are grown on them are, are so much more nutrient dense, have more phytochemicals, have way more minerals and vitamins and are much better for you. When we, they, it was kind of intense, but they, they basically um, harvested this bison, which means they shot it at very close range. It basically dropped before it even heard the bullet, uh, gun go off, and then they, they butchered it. And when they opened it up, it was amazing. The, all the fat was like deep orange. And I was like, what is that? And like, they're like, that's all the phytochemicals from the plants that were in the plants. Because so typically salmon, it's white, white is what you Yeah, like when, when you eat salmon, fat, yeah. it's from the, and the plants that the salmon are eating. It's orange. Is there antioxidants? That's all in the animal. So our, our food system is, 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 is broken right from the, the farm. So we need to change it from the, the field to the fork all the way across. And regenerative agriculture has the power to restore local communities, restore their economies, to restore ecosystems, to sequester carbon, to increase the, the microbiome of the soil, which increases the nutrient density of our food, I mean, and create more uh, food, abundant food, profitable um, um, system. And, and we're sort of having to move that way. Otherwise, we're, we're done. Um, they might have seen the movie Kiss the Ground. There's a new one coming out called Common Ground. Um, and and those, are, those are really powerful movies that describe the importance of really reimagining our, our farming system. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I'm hoping what you guys got from that is that, you know, in order for us to live healthy, thriving lives and live to be 120, we need our food system to be healthy. We need our soil to be healthy. We need our communities to be healthy. So health is not just an individual no journey. It's something that we're doing collectively in relationship with each other and in relationship with our food system and the people who grow our food and the people that harvest our food and our beautiful planet that provides all of this abundant nourishment for us. So, yeah, it's true. you know, we actually are in this extraordinary time right now with all the knowledge we have, we know what we need to do. And so it's time for us to you know, take all this abundance of, of health because all y'all are going to live to 120. So we're going to get to work together on this until the day that we die and making this a, a, a really flourishing planet. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana. Yeah. I mean, you you've been working on it's this. Exciting. Trip. It's exciting. It's an exciting moment. I think there's. Uh, I see like the the rising consciousness about uh, moving toward a regenerative system of farming at at all levels of government moving consciousness around changing the mental health system by dealing with trauma through psychedelics which is amazing with veterans and farmers i mean it's, it's really quite remarkable and also the emerging science of how we actually can create health are i think kind of really positive trends and so ho hopefully we don't kill ourselves before we get there by doing all the wrong things but i i feel very hopeful and i think you know it's kind of a best of times worst of times moment in history but i i i, I I'm a, a, a pathological optimist, so I think we're going to be okay. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I was just going to say, do you want to close with an invitation um, to this audience to join you in something? Thank you. Well, anybody, yeah. obviously, if you want to uh, join the the, the um, effort to change the food system, it, my nonprofit is called Food Fix, and you can go to foodfix.org and learn more about it. If you want to support it, that would be amazing. Uh, I think the, um, you know, for your own personal health, obviously, you can check out my work and podcasts and Young Forever book. Uh, it's all in there. Like the, the, everything I sort of mentioned, I know I went fast. It's, it's all in there. And, and really in depth, too. And yeah, you really break roadmap. it down to make it accessible. I mean, there's a lot of longevity books out there that are great, but they're sort of high level. This is like, what the hell do I do next? And how do I implement and translate the science into daily habits and behaviors that can help me thrive and by you all thriving the world can thrive so that's the whole point of all this oh thank you so much mark and thank you guys so much for thriving with us what a wonderful afternoon